Welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins. All right, guys, I'm here with Boris. Boris is one of the boldest entrepreneurs I've ever met. He actually has a iPhone without a case on, so he is one of the uh, bolder people that we have had on the pod. Uh, Boris, good to have you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Boris, I want to talk to you about unsexy business ideas, but I also want to talk to you about the uh, company that you were a solo founder and you exited that company. Can you tell me mm -hmm. about that company and what that process was like for you? Yeah, so you know the, the two things tie together. So everyone's like, oh, what's this cool thing you're working, you're the CEO of a company, blah, blah. I'm like, no, no, I'm yeah. the CEO of like a cockroach company is what I would call it, yeah. right? Like nobody looks at it, it just scuttles along on the ground, prints money, it's amazing. But it survives a nuclear blast. Exactly, and so, you know, what the company was is, you know, depending on the audience, they may have heard of something called Jira or Confluence. Yeah. Those products are made by a company called Atlassian. I spent four years working there uh, on the support team. And when I was on the support team, I was like, you know, uh, I don't think that we're providing the level of service that customers want. Uh, and, you know, Atlassian ended up increasing level of service over time. But my thesis was that given that I was working with enterprise customers and given that there was a specific performance profile of large customers that like just wasn't being met at the time, right. that I could go and fix this performance issue which was costing hundreds of thousands of dollars to the top thousand customers and I could fix it for like 10K. Did you work with Atlassian on this company? Like, no, no, no. So doing? I quit to okay. like start this thing. Yeah. And I started it and I was explicitly like, I'm not gonna join their partner program. I don't want anything to do with them because I don't want to be bound by the terms of the partner program. Okay. I was like, I don't want a non disparagement clause. I don't want this and that. Like, I want to do whatever I solo. want. Yeah. yeah, I was like, I'm, I'm going solo. I'm smarter than everyone. Yeah. Right? Like, even when I worked at Atlassian, like, uh, part of why I started the company was a uh, former boss of mine told me, he's like, we'd like, I'd like argue about what we should do. And, you know, I was always like, like typical entrepreneur stuff, right? You're like, I know best. And they're like, no, you don't. Yeah. And at some point, he says to me, he says, Boris, if you know better than everyone here, just go and start a company and prove it. And, you and I did. So, so Rick, thanks. Uh, shout out to you, Rick. Yeah, sure. All right, so we gave a shout out to Rick. Rick, thank you. Yeah, so, so Rick. Rick, uh, Rick prompted me. And then so I started the company, started getting these large enterprise customers. What year was this? Uh, 2016, 2017? 2016? I forget. Yeah, okay. somewhere around there. Um, and started the company, started getting these big customers. Um, started doing these like short engagements. Anyways, long story short, I'm gonna like com compress seven years down. Uh, 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 tears, sweat. Struggle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I can tell you the crying stories. <laughs> what happened was I ended up joining the partner program. So what the company did at the time of exit was we would resell Atlassian licenses, okay. right? So we would come to a large organization like Megacorps, right? Like 2,000 yeah. 2, employees plus. Um, up to like hundreds of thousands of employees, and we would sell them the licenses. We would take, we would make a percentage on that transaction. We would then sell a suite of services, so implementation, training, consulting, you know, whatever you can imagine, and then one-off projects, whatever, right? Yeah. So typical services, and then we also made a whole suite of software that we would sell to those customers and others in the Atlassian ecosystem through the Atlassian marketplace. So, so in business terms, you're a barnacle and a whale. Is that yeah fair? yeah so, so this concept is that like you have a fast growing company like at Atlassian they have a yep. massive pool of customers they're yep. growing very fast but you are also growing fast because you're riding this wave yes but I don't use the term barnacle because barnacles are attached to the whale pretty securely okay. right I always actually there's a another gentleman in the ecosystem who, who gave me this idea but I, I stuck with it so Yari thanks for, thanks for this one but he's told me he's like look the big company is the whale, and you're the little fish that's eating the dirt off the whale. Okay. <laughs> and what's gonna happen is periodically the big fish will go by a rock and you will be killed by being crushed up against that rock. Okay. And the fish isn't doing it because the fish wants to crush you. The fish is just being a fish and you're caught in the wrong place in the wrong time, right? right? Which the, the, the business way of saying that is platform risk. Right, 100%, like you're very much dependent on this one platform. If they yes. change something or anything, then you're in trouble. Yes, and yeah. so for me, a lot of what led to my selling the company was that after four years of working at Atlassian, or three three years, ten months, something like that, and you know, six or seven years, I forget exactly how much of running this company. That was eleven years of being in the same platform and ecosystem and everything, 
and I just was emotionally tired of getting beat up by that kind of experience. Whenever I was thinking about like your exit and what you were going through, right? You're a solo founder. Solo founder. Did you have anyone that you were working with? The team was about 15 to 17 people. The contractor employee split was more of a legal distinction than anything okay. else. So um, basically anyone located in the United States was an employee. Anyone located outside the United States was a contractor just for compliance reasons. But I think we we're about 17 people at the time I sold the company. How many people were abroad versus local? The majority were abroad. So, so that's pretty good from like um, an yeah. outsourcing standpoint is you were doing this pretty early at a pretty small size. Yeah. Yeah. So 100% um, okay. remote from day one, watching the current, you know, uh, remote and RTO and all, all of this debate, um, I'm very much anti-remote at this point. If I start another company, at least for the early, let's say, four to eight hires, yeah. I would want in person. You want them face to face, nose to nose. I think that the goal of a startup that most people don't realize is to fail fast, yeah. right? Like, because you don't want to invest 10 years into something that like doesn't go anywhere, right? right. You really want to like move really, really, really fast and test the hardest possible thing yeah. and like fail quickly and then move on with your life if it doesn't work. And Whatever you can do to accelerate that time to like, oh, this doesn't work, I need to go do something else, is, uh, I think, valuable. And I think that any forcing function that contributes to that is good. And so that face-to-face, -face, you essentially want more reps. You want that ability to move really, really fast to be able to learn from each other. More quickly. reps and and more contexts, okay. right? So I think shared contact, like communication is hard, right? Like basically, the majority of modern day problems are communication problems. Yeah, 100%. Like we could solve like world hunger if we just agreed that like, <laughs> oh, we're willing to like, you know, shift these things around or like, like it, it's all, it's all comms, right? So right. if it's comms and coordination, then you have to like look at like where does communication work and where does communication fail? And there's like tons of research that shows that the more context that two people share, the more they're able to communicate effectively and quickly. I mean, how much of uh, communication is nonverbal? It's like an insane percentage, right? Exactly. And so you're missing that. And I think we've all sent that Slack message where we're like, I'm so sorry. Like the context is wrong and then you have to go back Yep. and it's awkward and, and uncomfortable. To tone is misunderstood, right? Yeah. Like intent is misunderstood, etc. cetera. And um, so I think there's that, right? And then there's also like the idea of creating like, if I want to hire an excellent engineer, yeah. then I should optimize for someone who's an excellent engineer, right? And if we have shared contacts, great. If we don't, that should also be fine. And the solution isn't to be like, oh, I should hire everyone with my exact background, which, you know, very common. Very but like, culture. yeah, yeah. But the solution instead should be like, let's create shared contacts very rapidly over time right. post hire, right? Yeah. And so I think even things like, let's just go out to lunch together every single day Yeah, is important in saying like, now we can BS about what we did last night or that TV show or something. And that stuff creates shared context. And that stuff is highly valuable to ensuring that the, the Slack message, even in the same office, is given a like, well, I don't think he was trying to be a dick, right? Like, or, or whatever. It gives more leeway. It gives more understanding, more empathy towards one another. There's a saying that I love, and it's that we judge um, ourselves by our intent and others by their actions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, we are so hard on other people on yep. Slack when their intention's probably good, yep. right? Um, so you, you have this remote company. You have 17 people. Yep. You scaled it for a pretty long time. Yep. And then what was, you're, you're getting a little bit tired. Yep. Led to the decision to exit. And so... To, so the, the, the exiting thing was interesting. Um, part of the downside of being a solo bootstrap founder was there was no one to hold me accountable. Okay. Right? So there was no board. Yeah. There was no other investor. Like, it was all my money, all my equity. Everything was on me. Right? Right. Which meant also that I could get away with doing dumb things and no one was like, hey, that's not okay. Right. Right? And one of the, I don't know if it's a dumb thing, but one of the things I started doing was every year in August for my birthday, I would sell the company or try to sell the company. How often did you do this? For Every 10 year. Years? For, no, no, for like six years, seven That's years. That's a yeah. long time. Yeah, yeah. So 
Happy birthday, me. Well, no, every birthday I would kick off the process, right? Okay. But the cool thing was that it actually ended up being this forcing function of like, well, let's put the books in order. Let's right. let's make sure that I can tell the story of why we went from here to here last year and where we plan to go next year. If you are a sole founder or you have not sold a company before, going through the process of selling the company the first time is incredibly helpful. Like you understand yeah. how other people view you. You look at your company from the outside in. It reminds you to work on the company and not just in the company. Yep. So I like and and, and there's this, also like you, you just learn about like, you know, the, the gentleman who you were interviewing before before was talking about how in their uh, in their company they didn't know what like gap accounting was. For me, right, because there was this like sale process that I was kind of running, I knew what they cared about. I knew yeah. what buyers wanted very early on, right? And like, yeah, I didn't know the list of like 5,000 due diligence items that you do post LOI. Right. But all of the pre-LOI stuff, like I was very familiar with like year after year after year. So you do this six times yeah. and were you, did you have some interest? Yeah, yeah. Or so I, I haven't decided if I'm infamous or notorious in my ecosystem, okay. but it's, it's like a very, I'm very well known for being very loud and aggressive, right? So okay. better or worse, like there's pros and cons to it, but I basically knew all of the executives of my competitors. Right. Um, and so it was very easy for me to like call someone up and be like, hey, Joe, like I'm putting it on the market. You want to talk this year? And you're like, right? it must be your birthday. Yeah, well, yeah, they, <laughs> yeah. This was happening over and over again. And so I was kind of getting valuations and being like, oh, that's like, I'm not interested, not interested, not interested. And at the end, what ultimately happened was I I got a valuation which I thought was fine, um, but it you know uh, I think like I wrote this blog post that went semi viral like like nerd viral right front page of Hacker News but not like any anything beyond that. That's nerd big. Yeah, yeah, uh, I was like like I was like yeah, yeah, was like yeah. Uh, but it was called like I regret selling my startup, right? right? And one of the things that I talk about there is that like this point I made earlier, I did not have a board, yeah. I did not have advisors, I did not you know, have, well, let's just to be direct, I hired really poor legal and, and financial representation on my side. They yeah. did such a bad job that the buyer's lawyers were like, hey, we need to help you because this is unethical for us at this point. Um, that's always a bad sign. Yeah, when um, the other team is yeah, like, when hey, the other team's like, hey, let me help you with this yeah, layup, yeah, yeah, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, like, I tried to make it very clear in that post, um, and people still misunderstood it, but, like, my acquirer has treated me exceptionally well, right? I am yeah. not the story of, like, somebody came and screwed me over and treated me poorly and I didn't get my earn out. Like, none of that happened. My acquirer is very, very nice. It, it is one of the rare stories of very kind and nice private equity people. They, I'm still employed there. I still do work. You know, I, my, my team does a great job. But like, I got a bad valuation and that's my fault, not theirs, right? They were doing their job correct. Hey, podcast listeners. Whenever I was first scaling my business, Support Ninja, I was trying to figure out if there was an operating system or a framework that would help me figure out how do I structure these departments? How do I get the right people in the right seats? How do I navigate building my uh, standard operating procedures? And it was at that point that I came across Traction by Gino Wickman and the EOS framework. Um, highly recommend it. If you guys are looking for an operating system to run your business, check out EOS Worldwide. And we also made this entrepreneurship network called Founder Org. That's a great way to connect with other entrepreneurs that are also figuring out how to run and scale their business. If you guys are interested in either, check out eosworldwide.com and founderorg.com. All right, back to the pod. Was it the initial number? Was it the earnout? What led yeah, to so, it so being the wrong number? Out. It was, the problem was that the, the, the thing I described was that there were three lines of business, okay. right? And so it was a blended valuation on the EBITDA across all three. Okay. And the software part was the one making all the real money, but it, the, that got the services and licenses multiple applied to it basically. I see. And so it's like I, can, I, can't, like, I can't share specific numbers, but what I can tell you is that, so I sold the company roughly two years ago, yeah. and the acquirer has made more in free cash flow than the total purchase price, including equity since then. That is a fantastic acquisition for the private equity Amazing, firm. amazing. So, Were you so, like a so, single so, tier so, going down your tree? So, so, so last fall, I, I hit up the private equity guys. I was like, hey, you know, the software part of the company doesn't, uh, doesn't line up with the rest of the business. Like, let me just buy it back, okay. right? And I was like, and I know you're, you're gonna like take me for a ride on it, but like, you know, give me a fair price. I'll, get, I'll take out debt, I'll buy it back and it'll be fine. 
And then they came back to me with a number that was almost 4X my total acquisition price Ooh. 18 months later for, for, for a subset of the entire business. That sings a little bit. Yep. And like, you know, again, they were very polite. They like called in and they're like, look, we know this is going to sound really rough. Like, we're not trying to be dicks. This is just what we think we can sell. Right. And they have LPs and a exactly. board that they're accountable exactly. to. They exactly. Can't just, yeah. Exactly. Right. So okay. like, I'm not, I'm not like upset with them or anything like that. Like, you know, they got to do, the, you know, I play the game poorly. Right. And well, you, you had great, your first exit, right? And that's a very big deal. In this podcast, we talk a lot about lot, that first exit and how it's different from the yeah, yeah, yeah. The, right. the, the future ones will not be the same. One hundred percent not. Right, and you're a different person and a different entrepreneur yep. now. And so you sold that business. You're still working with a private equity firm, and yep. you talked about buying it back. Did you end up buying it back? No, 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 not at that price point. Like, so let's talk about unsexy business ideas. Yeah. What are some of the unsexy business ideas that are on your list? We were joking that all entrepreneurs have this list essentially of businesses that we would like to run. And so whenever we're at dinner, or doing the run club. Yep. Uh, raw dog or not? Yeah, right. Yeah. You uh, you're, you're like, oh, there's this idea. You jot it down in your this app, and then whenever you're trying to figure out what's the next thing to do, you go through the list. Yeah. So like one of the really boring ones, I think, but is an interesting one is that uh, in February, Yahoo and Google said that if your email domain crosses a certain spam threshold, they'll okay. just they'll just block all emails from your domain, yeah. right? And if you think about like the number of software companies that send emails that contain user-generated content is pretty high, right. right? So if you imagine, and I'm not even talking about like anything wild. What I'm talking about is like Zendesk. So, so you have Zendesk, right? And you're like, yeah. okay, like I'm going to email into Zendesk and right. I will put spam in there, right? Because I'm an automated spam bot and I found your incoming email address for support tickets somewhere. Right. So I send that to that, right? Now Zendesk is going to send an email of that to a support agent to be like, hey, this is assigned to you. Please read this ticket. And they get flagged. And they and now Zendesk would get flagged for that, right? Right. So basically, everybody that needs to send outbound emails now needs to do their own spam scoring and not send certain emails and know how to then provide feedback to their users and administrators of, hey, you expected an email to be sent in this situation, but it wasn't, and here's why, right? So sendability has always been a thing, but it's been sendability more of like, is this email valid, right? Yeah, yeah. But now you have another layer of sendability yeah. where it's like, you might go to spam purgatory yeah. and spam jail, yep. right? And so would this be just like a layer on top of the, so the server? I think that there's a small business to be built here for a solopreneur. Like this okay. is like a bootstrap thing where you just create an API, yeah. right? It literally, this should be like a very, very like simple Cloudflare worker, right? Where yeah. like, and some kind of like auth system and billing system, right? Where you then go to these companies and be like, hey, you have this like whole system, right? Like, do you guys want a spam score so that you can like run every email against, right? And I will just charge you per request and it'll be like one one millionth of a cent per test, right? And yeah. something like this. My guess is that most companies will say like, hey, I'm too smart for that. Like we can build this ourselves. Um, you would and, be surprised. And you would be surprised. Yeah. I was talking with the guy, with one of the guys who works on the Atlassian email like sending team. And it's like a massive team that's doing like highly, highly complex things around rate limiting and like recipient filtering. Right. And like all, like it's a huge team basically. It is, do, they're doing very, very surprising things. Like for someone like him, like I would totally encourage him to just look at what he's built and like go and build that as a service. Because like that internal email infrastructure is amazing. Cold outbound email like has gone into the gutter. Like yeah. it's brutal. Well, forget cold outbound. I'm just talking about transactional. Yeah. Like, like, like cold outbound is a whole nother thing. I'm talking about well, like, 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 like both of them are like yeah, it's they're, tough. They're buried. Yep. Um, okay, I'm I'm going to swap you. You, you gave an unsexy business idea. Yep. I'll, I'll trade you a sexy business idea. Okay. So I'm going to call this idea sexy goat. All okay. Right? Or uh, bath ba bomb. And the bath ba bomb. Oh, we talked. To <laughs> Did we talk about this on the? On the so. so guys, the pitch for bath ba bomb is I found this goat milk bath product that you uh, that has like lavender and a bunch of other stuff in it, right? And it uh, makes your skin feel amazingly smooth, right? And if you put this in the bath and it's just you, fantastic. You have a me moment, you know, you light some candles, you listen to Toto, like it's great, right? But if you do it with someone else, 
like it feels nice for you, feels nice for them, yeah. it's a little bit of both, you know, like, and so <laughs> Sexy Goat is a goat milk bath product that inevitably leads to uh, some quality time with you and your partner. So yeah. that's the pitch. The pitch is, as far as the value, is that we're solving the population crisis in Denmark and Japan. We're okay. single-handedly <laughs> creating families, generating value, you know, creating the, the workforce for tomorrow and the future Sexy Goat bath users. Yeah. And uh, that's my that's my sexy bath bomb idea. Okay. I don't know how I'm gonna take it to market though. I went shooting a couple of weeks ago with a bunch of post exit founders, and one of the guys in my car was uh, a founder of a like sexy chocolate brand. Dude, I heard was this like TikTok famous sexy chocolate? I forget, maybe I for, but he, yeah, it was like he he basically I, I don't know the brand name and like, but but I think what was interesting was I was talking with him about one of my ideas, and I was like talking about go to market, all this yeah. stuff, right? And he was like, oh, all we did was like ads, influencers, this type of stuff. And I was like, oh, and what was like your NRR? And he was like, zero. He was like, nobody bought twice. Because like the only way that you convince people to buy this is by making outrageous claims. And like you can never actually meet those claims. So what, and so nobody buys a second time. So this guy was like, I had sexy chocolate and then like nothing happened. No, he he, he, made, he, he, he grew it. He, he sold it well, for a bunch of money. But like, are, are we moving into like, from like boring to like odd to like weird ideas? Because I, I have dude, weird ones I can give you too. I think, I think we should bounce back and forth. I think like, okay. I also like, I like boring. Okay. Like, so mine is called meat bags. Okay. Okay. I'm sold. And meat bags are zin, but with meat instead of tobacco. Right? You so you just have like a little baggie that you stuff in here yeah. and you like chew. And instead of like tobacco, and instead of buzzing, it's just meat. And so it's slowly like eat, like like it like it like gets that like the the what's it called the oral fixation uh, right. people, yeah. right? Like it, it it addresses all that. Right? Do you think this is like something to wean off like snuff? Like is this something like you? No, I mean like, it could be, it could be that. Is it, it like hockey players or is it just like I, the everyday guy? I think it's I think it's the person that wants a snack but is okay. is calorie conscious. Yeah, and it's like because if you. If you think about like, for example, I eat a lot of carrots and cabbage. Yeah. Just because it like fills me up right. and without being a ton of calories or being unhealthy, yeah. right? And it's cheap, super cheap, right? And I eat a lot, so it's, <laughs> it kind of doesn't work super well. But uh, there's something psychological about like getting the calories in your mouth that like you don't actually need to eat. And I think that if you look, there's like this thing called Biltog or I'm probably saying it wrong, but uh, Bill Talk, okay. Bill Talk, I think is it's like it's like a I forget which country it's from, but it's a an African beef jerky basically, but it's much tougher. Okay. And so you eat it slower. It's whatever. The, when you're backpacking, it's nice. Like it's nice to have like some beef jerky that you're chewing on while you walk. Yeah. If you think about it, in backpacking, the 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 solution, the problem you're solving is I want calorie dense and light. Right. Right. Like that's that's really the problem. I mean, salt is nice too, but like yeah. that's really the two main things are, are are light and calorie dense. And like here, what I'm saying is like you take calorie dense and you focus on flipping that around to saying like, oh, it just needs to provide enough flavor. Have you and made an MVP for this? No, I was thinking about 3D printing little cages and putting meat in them, and my girlfriend got pissed at me and was like. I'm not, like, it, it, it borderline got into a fight where I was like, you have to support me on my stupid ideas. And she was like, this is really dumb. <laughs> I, I think it's a balance for a good spouse, right? Like you need to be supportive. And then on the other hand, you also need to be like, hey, honey, this is, this like is the really bad. pages that you're putting in your mouth, like, I'm not so sure about this. I had a boring idea around helping people with their property taxes, like on a Come recurring on. basis, because it's very easy to kind of understand where do they live. Um, that process of round appealing your property taxes is very straightforward. It's very legal heavy. And so like there's a room for like a solo entrepreneur to map out what that process is and the automation flows to send out the direct mail campaigns, to send out the email campaigns. Yeah. I think this very much reminds me of a, what's his name? Joshua, Joshua something The the like, I think it's, his company is called like do not pay. Do not something. pay. It's like the, like the That's it's like best the, name for a it's, company it's ever. It's like the automated thing to help you fight parking tickets and all. Basically, it's like it's was this on Shark Tank lawyer. or was this just? Uh... I don't know if he was ever on Shark Tank, but but he's he started this a long time ago, and the in the initial thing was that basically he had a template form that you could use to contest like parking tickets, and yeah. it, and it won almost always. And then he built other things, and so now there's like. 
you can like file a lawsuit against somebody in small claims court for like five bucks instead of hiring, you know, instead of having to wow. figure it all out. And that's so, huge. So he's basically got a lot of these utility legal functions. Um, I think it's a subscription now, so I'm not sh- like I- I'm not sure it, like the value How makes sense. How many people are getting this many parking? A lot, tickets? and so it's like a New York City and, thing. No, no, no. I th- well, when I heard about it, I was living in San Francisco. So this was like eight, nine years ago. I don't yeah. know. Like recently, he was in the news because he was the guy that tried to put an actual AI. Like he was the guy who was like, I will go to court. And I will have an earbud in, and I will have ChatGPT basically telling me what to say. And the judge was like, "Absolutely not!" Like, because he he publicized it in advance, and oh, the judge would do that. Anyway, yeah, he so done it. so anyways, I, I think that was the last time he was in the news. I may be mixing up the details. I would fact check everything well, I said. This is fascinating. But but yeah, so I I think it was called "Do Not Pay." But this, but same uh, same concept, right? Of like of of automating like niche legal processes and allowing people to, to solve it at scale. It's prime for it because you have a standard set of processes, right? Yep. Anything that it's prime with a, a set series of, of workflows that you do that people don't normally want to do that's yep. time consuming, like that's yep. fantastic stuff. Yep. And so like there's also uh, services that help you like appeal when your flight gets canceled. Yep, or, yeah, yeah, there's a ton like of that. those. Yeah. Hey podcast listeners, I made Operator Equity as a place for entrepreneurs to invest and buy in other entrepreneur-led businesses. If you guys are interested in uh, learning more and possibly buying a business, or if you're interested in possibly selling your business to other entrepreneurs that have sold their business in the past, please reach out to operatorequity.com. I'm really excited about this new project, and I think that entrepreneurs should be buying more businesses. So if this resonates with you, check it out. Bye. One that I've been like recently thinking about, I I brought this up with Jeff actually uh, the other day, is like there is an amazing amount of weird sports that are being quite professionally produced. Okay. So if you're on TikTok or Instagram, like I see this stuff popping up all the time. Maybe that's my bubble. What are we talking about? But here? for example, I saw competitive drift dancing out of South Africa. I think it's South Africa. I'm like 90% sure based on accents, but the guys are drifting cars. And then a passenger is climbing out of the passenger seat and like dragging their body along the ground and doing all these dance moves while these guys are drifting cars, right? Okay. And it looks wild. I had no idea this was a so, thing. But, and like, so there's that. And then I think in Russia, the ones I've seen are, I think one is called like M2, which is the one where they like fight with swords and stuff in like full metal armor. Oh yes, right? okay. Yeah. So I there's that. that, there's the slap fighting, Right? There's the like. Every time I see that, I, th- I think concussion. Exactly. Exactly. Like when they're lined exactly. up and you see them get rocked so, and pass yeah, yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, but my point is that I would bet that there is enough of this specific content out there to start a 24 hour syndicated weird sports channel. So we're right? networking this, right? Right, yeah. And, and, okay. and you just you just be the guy that has that 24 hour weird sports feed. Is this like a YouTube channel kind of thing? I don't think so. I think you go like OTA with it, right? And you put ads on it and like you just, it's like well, traditional would media. Would be like uh, using like Kick or, or something I think, like that already existing? I think that most of the current platforms would ban a lot of the content. Right, like, like because it's too like, weird. To I think I think that some of the content would upset enough people that there would be enough moderation flags against it that yeah. it like the automated systems like it, it is very hard to fight against like mass reports, right? And so I think that there would be enough stuff that enough people would object to that they would get flooded with these like mass reports, and it's like inevitably going to go viral where like somebody gets upset about something. And so I don't think like you could run your own streaming thing, yeah. right? Like I don't see any like it's not that hard to run a well, streaming you need a service. Way to, like pull them into your platform of drift dancing, right? Yeah. Like you need a well, way to like, I think, hook them. I think the way is once you once you become the global rights holder, yeah. right? The first thing you do is you have to become the global rights holder to enough interesting stuff, right? Then you basically need to have it available for people to consume on your own platform. This and is a sexy you, idea. And then you go to influencers and you say, hey, like repost these clips. Like we will feed you clips. I could and totally all you got to do is like Snoop post your reactions. Yeah. And, well, and he doesn't smoke it. anymore. So maybe Martha Stewart Dude, that was a campaign. It. That was a, that wasn't real. Oh, you know okay. That? I don't know. I'm so like, I don't follow you, most media or news. Do you know the solo stove? Um, yeah. Isn't uh, the guy in PF now? Yes. Yeah, I saw that. I was yeah. like, <laughs> uh, so um, he's. I think he's based out of Dallas. Okay. Um, so Solo Stove had this campaign, which is like, 
uh, no smoke, right? Because yeah. they have a smokeless uh, oh. fire uh, pit, yeah. right? And so they got Snoop Dogg to do this campaign of like, I stopped smoking. It was on all the PR yeah. channels, not a real thing. Okay. okay. And then the CEO parted ways immediately after that. And so we weren't sure, was it because of the commercial or some something else? It's like, all, all comes a razor, right? Simplest yeah. explanation is probably the best. Like, probably just coincidence. Coincidence. Yeah. Or we ask in private. <laughs> or we ask in private. Yeah, we'll, we'll sleep back. Um, but anyways, yeah, like I could definitely see Snoop like doing the, the animal Plazanet Earth. Do you remember when he did that? When he was like calling the animals the wrong things? Oh, incredibly that's high. amazing. That's so hilarious. Fantastic. So a sexy business idea is a, there's like these RC planes that take off. And so you get a field. Yep. Yeah, RC planes. I flew them as a kid. Did you, um, have you seen the ones the where FPVs. they have virtual reality yeah, yeah. first person? Yep. I can kind of see that plus drone racing, but making a venue that's designed for that. So making a venue that's designed for RC planes, and it's cool. These planes like actually do dog fights and like they do a so, thing. So have you seen the the, the uh, guys that are strapping like weapons to these like mock weapons? To mock these weapons. Th- well, right. no, they're like they're like mock in the sense that like they're dropping like little bombs instead of big bombs, but like. Like they, they're, they're I didn't know they were actually dropping stuff. Yeah, that was so, virtual. So, so, so no, no, no. Like I saw a video. These guys they had like World War II style model airplanes, and they were like, so, oh no, they they weren't actual bombs. What they did was they put whistles on the plane and on the bombs, and okay. they were dive bombing these things to reproduce the sound of German dive bombers from World War II and That's trying so to like, like mimic it perfectly. And I'm like, I'm like, you know when you like dress up in the wrong outfit for a reenactment and you're really happy about it? I'm like, I'm, like, I'm not sure if that's what we should be doing, but whatever. But it's incredibly interesting one to see. And so I think that this could be in your, your network. Yeah, definitely. Where are you gonna call the network? I don't. I don't have a name for it. This is. This is not. My, I, this isn't a named idea. This is. This is one of my like throwaways that I'm. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get can. other people to build this. That's why I'm bringing it up. That, that's the best thing about a venture studio or a family office is that you're like, hey, I have this idea, and you're like, you you wait for someone to say, oh, I know the perfect person to run that, and then you're like, oh, okay. I, I got a really boring one, which is like an organizational problem. Should this be the one that we end on? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So. You go to all the library systems in the United States. Okay. Okay. You get them to invest into a company. So they become equity shareholders of this company. And then they have a commitment to buy books from this company. And you've now funded essentially a publicly funded publisher that is guaranteed to sell a certain volume of books to its shareholders. I have so many questions. Right? I mean, like libraries, I love libraries. I'm yeah. like the only one that has like a library. Yeah, me too, family. yeah. But like, uh, we're talking about physical publishing, right? Physical and ebook. But and I think e-books. ebook's the more interesting part. Okay, but they have a share in it, so you're helping fund the public library? No, no, no. The, the trick is, right, so today, a public library has some amount of dollars that they have to go and spend to acquire the IP that they consume or, or, or books, let, uh, right? So they have to, well, books, music, videos, software, right? They lend a lot more than just books, right? right? And so today, depending upon, it's like the physical stuff is much easier, right? Like because the laws around it are much more defined, right? Like you go, you buy a book, you can do whatever you want with it. The publisher can't stop you, right? Like, yeah. you, you, I mean, you can't photo, you can't reproduce it, but you can lend it, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want, right? right. But with a digital copy, all of that goes out the door, right? It's all licensing, 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 right? Yeah. So I, I consume almost all my books through digital uh, media, whether it's audiobooks or eBooks. Uh, thank you to New York. Public Library, Brooklyn Public Library, and uh, Bronx Public Library systems. I'm a member of all three. Um, but but when I, every time I consume a book, the library actually has to pay another licensing fee. Okay. I mean, it's not quite right. Actually, what they do is they buy it in packs and whatever. But like roughly translated, every use has a cost right. to the library. Which, if you think about how libraries are set up, that's like the exact opposite of how they're supposed to work. Right. Like they're supposed you to spend once, cost. reused, right? Right. And so, like, you're never going to get the big publishers to agree to give a perpetual license right. on these things. So uh, like the only solution is there has to be a publisher who's financially structured in a way where they are willing to do that. So what's the thing that a publisher would need in order to do that? Well, guaranteed income, 
there has to be an incentive to the publisher to basically give these perpetual licenses, right? Yeah. And if they're owned by the libraries, then there's an inherent uh, incentive to the ownerships to reduce their cost, right? right? So th you have that. But the, then why does the author work with this publisher versus the other one, right? And the answer is guaranteed purchasing. So you right? won't reach, you won't reduce risk. Well, yeah, you basically cap the downside, right? If you look at how a publisher works, right, it's exactly the same thing as VC. The majority of books don't return anything yeah. and a very, very small percentage return a lot more. Do you think right? that there's something around self-publishing that this publisher could be a self-publishing platform potentially as sure, well as? Sure, but that's not the interesting part, right? The interesting part is that you can take the curation and the, the picking of winners and move it out of the hands of you know a few agents at these uh, at these uh, big publishers and into the hands of librarians, yeah. right? Because basically you'd have a preprint, you'd circulate it, right? The librarians with thumbs up, thumbs down right. as the equity holders in the publishing, right? It'd be like a like a partnership. I like that you're right? re-engaging librarians, right? Yeah, like, that's pretty cool. Dude, librarians are amazing. Like if if whoever's listening to this is if you're thinking of starting a company, especially if it's something more traditional. Right? Like, go to your local library and ask them, like, hey, what resources do you have on, like, understanding, like, the statistical distribution of, you know, whatever your ideal customer profile is and, you know, incomes by zip code in blah, blah, blah. And guess what? They are literally professionally trained to do this. They are, like, like the, the, like, here in New York, for example, you're like, oh, I may be interested in finance. I may be an amateur interested in finance. Right. The branch over by, um, I'm forgetting the name of the branch, but it's right by the, the beautiful branches, diagonally across the street from it. But they have Bloomberg terminals that you can reserve and come and use a Bloomberg terminal. Fully featured, everything paid for by the library. Right? I love like, that you're such a big advocate for the library. I think that's awesome. And also, like I like the counter movement. Like the counter movement of like, we're not sure how libraries are going to like progress or how they're going to change. In some cases, they need to change. Like yeah. that they can be co-working spaces. They can yeah. be 3D printing innovation centers. And yeah. so, I think that's that's awesome, um, guys. Those are the ideas that we have today. Boris, thank you so much. Where should people go to find you? Yeah. So uh, nothing easy about this dot com. <laughs> And it's a great blog. acronym. It's it, neat. <laughs> I, I like that you found it. And then also, like, what um, what about the blog article? Like, where? So, if you go to nothingeasyaboutthis.com, it's like a very basic blog. Yeah. So if you just scroll down, I think it's the first or second blog post. But they're literally just like line items. Very easy to find. Uh, it's called "I Regret Selling My Startup." Um, please do not read into my like psychological health because some people do that and they're like, oh no, I am wonderful. My life is amazing. Like, I, need a hug I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I literally had people in, in the like Hacker News comments. Like I tried not to respond to most of it, but like one of them was like, this guy sounds miserable. Like, is he okay? Like he, and I was like, no, no, I, I do have this regret, but like, I am still a very, very lucky and fortunate. My life is amazing person, right? Like, Whereas I think you're you're fantastic, and I also love that you're sharing. Like yeah. I think that you're you're putting yourself out there with the blog article that you did, but also with this podcast, and yeah. you're, you're sharing your story. So I think it goes way. Yeah, and I guess if you want to message me, it's my full name on both Twitter and LinkedIn. Yeah. Not not that hard to find. If you guys have an unsexy business idea for Boris, send him those. Yeah, or sexy. Like yeah, or sexy. Or, or if you want a co-founder, let me know. That's also a good one. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. That's the pod. Cheers. Thank you. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter. <laughs>